Okay. Well, let me just welcome everyone. Welcome to our HIV Center Grand Rounds. Um, nice to see familiar faces. Um, I'll just announce, um, if anyone else has any announcements, please feel free to make them about any significant events or upcoming events that we should all know about. Um, but I will remind us of our next Grand Rounds this month of April, on April 21st. We have Lisa Eaton from the University of Connecticut talking about interventions to address stigma and healthcare disparities among Black sexually diverse men, expecting change without affecting change, question mark. Um, and then on May 5th, uh, heads up, we have another, um, we have our early stage investigative grand rounds, another double billing. We have um, Samantha Stonebreka and um, Ofole Mbako. So that's in May 5th. So again, next, next rounds, Lisa Eaton, April 21st. So unless anyone has any announcements, I will go on to introduce our first presenter today. I'll present them one by one. Um, we have Charlene Beckford and um, Jenny Higgins. So let me, let me start with uh, Charlene Jarrett, who is the Director of Epidemiology and Strategic Information for the Jamaica Country Programs in the Institute of Global Health Sciences, University of California, San Francisco. Um, previously, she served as the Senior Director of Monitoring and Evaluation in the National HIV STI Program and at the National Family Planning Board, Ministry of Health, Jamaica. Um, Charlene completed her PhD in clinical psychology at the University of Massachusetts Amherst um, with a Master of Science degree in biostatistics here at Columbia University and when she was a postdoc fellow with us at the, at the HIV Center. Um, she's authored and co-authored several peer-reviewed journal articles related to her clinical and research interests in the epidemiology of HIV in Jamaica and mental health among persons living with HIV and those at high risk for HIV infection. I can go on and on, but I'll say besides, you know, this academic work and other leadership roles, she also supports the research training and clinical supervision of clinical psychology graduate students at the University of West Indies, Mona, and within local NGOs that serve persons living with HIV and LGBT communities. And as a clinical psychologist, Charlene, I love to hear that you're doing that kind of work as well. <laughs> it's so great to see you um, and welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you. It's really <laughs> nice to be here and thank you for your um, introduction. One second before I start. Yes, working from home. Um, <laughs> yes, so thank you for the kind introduction and it's really nice to be back and to see familiar names. I look forward to a time after COVID when we actually get to see each other again. Um, okay, so I'll share my screen and I will move into the talk and let me know if you're in we're seeing yeah there you go perfect That's okay. good. all right perfect awesome all right great so today in my talk i'll really just give a broad overview of the work that we do in jamaica um i work with ucsf as bob mentioned and our work here is to provide technical support to the Jamaica Country Program. And so we'll, I won't go in, in depth in any one area, but really give a sense of what it's like being an implementing partner and the scope of the work that we do. Um, UCSF works as an implementing agency for CDC and we're funded through PEPFAR. I'll talk about the main areas that we've been working to strengthen, which are the gaps in retention on ART and viral suppression. And then, of course, the last two years has been really um, just highly impacted by COVID-19. And so I'll talk a little bit about how that has affected the work and how we've adapted to that in trying to implement our programs. So this is a map of sorts of the Caribbean and PEPFAR support PEPFAR support has shifted over the years in Jamaica, in the Caribbean, and currently 
the work is concentrated in Trinidad and Jamaica, and the work in Guyana is winding down. Um, the, I got interested in HIV as a pre-doctoral intern in clinical psychology, where I worked in an HIV treatment site in Brooklyn. And as you all in New York would know, Brooklyn has a huge Caribbean American population. And in that work, found out about the scope of the epidemic in the Caribbean being the second highest prevalence after Sub-Saharan Africa. And this was back in 2003. Yeah, it was a while ago. And it hasn't changed much in terms of the epidemic in the Caribbean. Um, but that really was the interest. And working at the HIV Center, I worked with Susie, who at the time were exploring grants around working with Caribbean American immigrants and really trying to understand drivers of risk uh, in that population. And then after completing the program, I moved back to Jamaica and really I've continued that work, um, but from an implementing um, the implementation side. So in Jamaica, we have an estimated 32,000 persons live with HIV. It's a mixed epidemic with concentrated among MSM and transgender persons. And also in the general population, the prevalence is estimated at over 1%. Among MSM, 29.8%, and among transgender women, 51%. So a significant epidemic. Um, the epidemic in Trinidad is similar, um, is similar. So really that's a profile in the two countries where we work. As an implementing partner for CDC, UCSF has historically been the strategic information partner. The work has been around strengthening data collection system, um, leading evaluations, surveillance activity, research, special studies, um, building the capacity in country to use data, gather data, analyze data um, to monitor progress towards epidemic control. In 2019, after we completed a really challenging but really um, successful um, biobehavioral surveillance study among MSM and trans persons in Jamaica, CDC invited UCSF to become treatment partners. And so that's how we shifted into this work. And that's the work I'll actually share with you today. Um, and as treatment partners, we only work in Jamaica. And I believe this is actually the only country where our group, the Global Strategic Information Group at UCSF, this is the only country where we do treatment work. And so it's been an interesting journey because we're really building the systems here and really prioritizing how we use the data systems we've put in place, the data processes, and using the using those systems to work with country partners to actually improve their treatment work. So this is a map of Jamaica. And in Jamaica, UCSF supports six sites. Um, to kind of orient you, this area is Kingston. So this is the capital area, um, St. Andrew and Kingston, very um, much a capital and over, I believe over 50% of the population could be found, can be found in this area of the island. St. Catherine is another urban parish and the three largest HIV sites are in these two parishes and they are supported by UCSF. The other two sites, Maypen Health Center and MCC, Mandeville Comprehensive Clinic, these are rural parishes, smaller clinics. And so we support six sites across five parishes and include some of the largest sites and smaller sites. This area, this is a tourism area, another implementing partner, ITEC, they support treatment sites along this area. But in our six sites, we are providing support for just around 50% of the PLHIV population who are in treatment. Um, in terms of approach, I was mentioning that in transitioning to treatment partners, our intention really was to build on our strength as strategic information partners, which meant prioritizing the use of data and working with sites to use the systems that we had built. So we had worked since 
maybe 2012 in the Caribbean doing SI work and since 2015, 16 in Jamaica working with the strategic information team. And so we had helped to develop a treatment site information system, TSIS. And this is a web-based system that link clinical, demographic, pharmacy, treatment data, lab data for patients who are in the public health sites. And so this was an opportunity for us now to work within sites to help um, treatment teams use this data that they were collecting to actually improve their clinical management, improve their program management, and also inform quality improvement activities. And using this data to identify gaps, identify patients who were out of care, patients who were in care but not adherent, patients who are in care but not suppressed. And that essentially is the data to care approach, which we coined as thesis to care in Jamaica um, to really personalize it for the island. But the goal was to use this data to improve the different areas on the cascade. So in 2019, when we started, this is a view of the different 1990, 90 cascades across the Caribbean where PEPFAR had worked at that time. And you know, the 1990 targets are around ending HIV and get, uh, achieving epidemic control. And as you can see, Jamaica was lagging behind the other islands. Um, the largest gaps were in the second 90, the number of persons who were, or the percent of persons who were on ART and the third 90, which is the percent of persons who were virally suppressed. Um, so quite low, um, but also you will note, you know, size wise, the estimated PLHIV population in Jamaica exceeds the population across all other islands on this graph. So we, we are a larger island, um, there are resource challenges, there are stigma issues, a lot of things that um, affect diagnosis and treatment for persons. And so those are some of the challenges that we've had to contend with. Um, so I'll talk about some of the things we did as we tried to address the issues around retention in care and retention on ART. So our first task was a return to care surge. And this was implemented between February 2019 and July 2019. At the time of the 26 thousand persons who are aware are estimated to be aware of their status and alive, only just about 12,900 were on treatment. Based on data from the HIV surveillance system and the data system that we were helping, thesis that we were helping to um, revamp at that point, there were a number of patients who were identified as linked but dropping out of care. And so we, as UCSF, and at the time we collaborated with NASTAD, which was another implementing partner for CDC, we collaborated and jointly led an activity to trace 4,220 patients who were identified as lost from the sites that I showed on the previous slide. So this, these are just the patients who had gone and dropped out of care from the five sites. So our task was to determine their current status, return out of care patients to clinic and rapidly reinitiate and implement strategies to sustain them on ART. The main activities we did, and this was also in close collaboration with the Ministry of Health, the regions, each site, each parish um, works under the authority of our regional health um, system. And so we worked collaboratively with them. The Ministry of Health provided the final list of persons who were out of care, who met the criteria for loss to follow up. UCSF worked to digitize the patient tracing log form. We provided staff in data entry and monitoring the data. We used a system, this was an ODK, so we monitored submissions for accuracy and prepared shared bi-weekly reports, which were shared in national meetings with all of the sites, the regional heads and the ministry, reps, CDC as well. And so we would 
go through these reports and strategize for the coming weeks to be able to meet these targets. Um, we also had a survey, a loss of follow-up survey that looked at the reasons why persons dropped out of care. And this was also collected um, among patients who are returned to care. And this was data that we analyzed. And then at the end, we also established a cohort that is being tracked through the thesis so that we can track the retention of all of the persons returned through this activity. So busy slide, but I'll walk you through it. So for the target of 4,220 persons, the protocol required making up to eight phone calls at different times of the day over the week and up to three visits to the addresses on file. So over 6,000 calls were made, over 2,000 home visits to try and locate the 4,000 missing persons. Um, at the end of July, we had returned 525 persons to care and we had resolved an additional 2,300 cases. Um, what's striking or what really stood out for us was a huge data issue in that a lot of the persons who were presumed out of care and um, lost to follow up were at other sites, but because the system hadn't been linked up to this point, it wasn't possible to track patients across sites. The other striking thing was the amount of persons who were found to be deceased. Um, so 600 persons on that list were actually located in death registries at hospitals or through the RGD, um, the Registrar General Department. A number had migrated, a few were incarcerated, and then there are also a few who were negative. At the end, we still had 1,100 that we just couldn't locate or agreed to return but didn't come back, and some who just refused to come to clinics. Um, the, in terms of the final outcome, reinitiating them on treatment, we were able to um, reinitiate 65 persons newly initiated on ART and then have 417 reinitiated on ART. So in the end, at the end of July, we had resolved 67% of the cases and massive amount of data cleaning. And that helped to really give a better view of the true status of patients in care in Jamaica. And there's just some pictures showing at the site level. So this is at the largest treatment sites where we had like, you know, the conference room and the staff who were involved in the different activities would tally the different paperwork and also track on their um, flip charts, their progress as they went through their probably almost 1500 lost patients at this site. The loss of follow-up survey was a really interesting part. So we looked at the reasons why persons left care. Sarah, which is where Kingston and St. Andrew and St. Catherine are, the, these are the urban parishes. And then Southern region are the rural parishes. And the reasons for dropping out of care was a little different um, at the sites in these parishes. So Sarah, a big reason was work interfering with coming to clinic or picking up their meds. Attending clinic could risk disclosure because of crowding and seeing so many persons seeing you out there. In the rural parishes, not having enough money or feeling better, so not thinking you needed to come to clinic and having family obligations, so needing to take care of kids or family, parents or spouses was a major issue. So this pointed to some structural issues, financial issues, education issues, and we use this data to identify additional services that were needed. Um, so coming out of that, right after the that initial search phase ended we provided technical financial support for additional clinic sessions evening clinics men's health clinics a satellite clinic to um, transfer patients from one of the more overcrowded sites we provided support to the team members to be able to make reminder calls um because forgetting was another big reasons why persons didn't show up we provided travel and food vouchers um, and this is something that the ministry does and global fund supports, but we were able to um, supplement those at the sites where we were working. And we also championed and scaled up our retention navigator program, which is led by peers. So persons who are patients at those sites who are doing well and were able to support these um, 
the patients who were we were returning to care. We also standardize a, a document to lead treatment literacy groups. And just to look at some of the data coming out of the evening clinics, this is at Comprehensive, the largest treatment site. We were able to support two evening clinics and between October and December, over 300 of 340 appointments were scheduled, 235 or 69% were kept, and there were two to eight walk-ins at each clinic session. So that was a significant boost to the number of patients seen. We also implemented treatment literacy sessions, um, and we were able to track a cohort through that. And we saw where half of the persons who participated in this in these groups became suppressed within three to six months. And then we saw significant um, or good progress in the ones who were unsuppressed in that they were on their way to suppression. We also implemented through the quality improvement work block appointments. So here we have a culture where you show up very early before the start of clinic and you get a number and it's a first come first serve basis. And this leads to persons being at clinic from 7 a.m., 6 a.m. until 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And this was part of that long wait interrupting their work and leading to persons dropping out of care. So a block appointment system was put in place where we were able to really educate patients. And when I say we, I mean the persons at the site and UCSF really just providing the technical, technical or financial support to move these interventions along. Um, so we're able to support this intervention where they educated the patients around the need to come at the time when you have an appointment and they really try to sustain this over um, several months. This block appointments had been tried in several um, sites previously, but the culture of showing up early and getting that number, that first number, just wouldn't shift. And so they were usually abandoned. But this time we were able to see it through and we we're able to reduce the wait time. And so 74% of patients were seen in less than two hours and another 32% were seen in less than one hour, or among those 32% were seen in less than one hour. And patients saw the benefit of it. They were less disgruntled, the clinic staff were happier, they were able to manage the patient flow much better. And this is a graph that kind of shows over time. What this also shows is where COVID um, entered the scene. So we started this in February, we had our first case in Jamaica, March 14th, and we just couldn't collect any intervention data for several months because everything was, you know, closed or disrupted. Um, the staff were just trying to adjust. Uh, patients weren't coming out to clinic. And so this was paused and then we picked back up in August. And so this is a sense of the data. And in November, this shows when we got our second wave and then our third wave, you know, so the impact of COVID and on data collection and clinic attendance, it was profound throughout the whole time. So did we, um, were we successful in retaining patients in care and on art over this time? Not, not, we have a retention problem, but there are some things that happen, not even COVID, but just we changed definitions midstream in terms of who was counted as in care. And so we saw a significant drop here. And then we transferred a lot of patients. And this was like a year into COVID where persons start, started leaving urban clinics, larger clinics and going to smaller clinics closer to home. And so we transferred, I think maybe almost 200 patients from two sites. And so, you know, so that affected measurement. So we really restarted our baseline here after the definition and the transfers. And so from there, we're seeing where we are seeing an increase in patients, but overall there is a net loss because we've added maybe a thousand new persons. But as you can see, our total patients in care have actually declined over time. Um, and so retention continues to be an issue in Jamaica. And so we, the COVID restrictions ended two months ago. And so we're just now restarting evening clinics group sessions because all of those were discontinued for two years. And so all of the interventions that we put in place to support retention, we had to stop during the COVID time or operate on a very um, scaled down basis. So we're hoping 
to really address retention moving forward. We've started evening clinics, we're restarting groups. Um, and we're also collecting data from persons we have noted are cycling in and out of care. And so moving forward, that really is the focus for us to get this pillar of the cascade strengthened and improved. I'll briefly, in my remaining four minutes or so, talk about the activities around that third 90, which is viral suppression. So when we started, this is the data of suppression across patients at PEPFAR facilities in the Caribbean. Of note, none of the Jamaican sites had 90% suppression amongst their patients. And this was striking because, you know, if you're on care, you're in care, you're on treatment, you know, after six to 12 months, you really should see suppression. And if not, you review and make adjustments. Um, but we were seeing patients who had been, had been in care for years and not attaining suppression. Um, UCSF was, um, we were supporting these five sites highlighted here. There's a six site that's not on this slide. And these again are include three of the largest, the three largest sites in Jamaica and two smaller sites. First thing we noted in reviewing the data was there was an issue with uptake in that a number of patients were overdue viral load or never had a viral load test done, which means there's no uh, measurement of their actual suppression. And then there were the striking amount of patients who had a current viral load but were unsuppressed. And so we pulled together a cohort, identified 623 persons implemented different interventions alongside the site, scaled up different interventions to get viral load testing done. By February 2020, 65% of these persons had come back in care, had an appointment, had a viral load test, and had a result in the system. There was another 19% where their result was pending. And 11% of the cohort we identified in May had become lost to follow up because we, there really is a retention issue. Of those who were tested, we found 81% were suppressed, which is, um, you know, which was significant. And so we started getting the sense that their, the reported suppression was likely an underestimate, but we also noted that there were some issues in terms of patients being on regimen that were not effective for them. Another activity we did numbers campaign and this is something the Ministry of Health had started and we were able to provide additional technical support and financial support and this was a clinic-wide intervention to really limit any stigma or um, any barriers to persons coming in to get that viral load test so it was know all your numbers blood pressure blood sugar your height your weight BMI HIV syphilis viral load testing so a clinic-wide health fair and this was successful in improving viral load uptake and we were able to model this at two of our other sites that also had very low uptakes. And I think we increased by over 500 the number of persons with current uptakes in fiscal year 20, so in FY21. So that was a major achievement for us. The other way we looked at it, we also identified a cohort of persons who were unsuppressed. Mean age for that group was 43 years. They had been on ART a mean time of 79 months and 40% of them were male. So again, these are patients who had been in care for a long time and they just were not suppressed. We implemented a number of interventions, enhanced adherence and counseling, reviewed the regimen, made changes where indicated, provided support for them to get to clinic, more frequent monitoring, and also established high viremia clinics, which were part of the evening clinic setup that we had. In February, when we looked at the data, 33% of this cohort were now suppressed. Um, another 44% who had results were still unsuppressed. And then we had lost, um, it was 7% of this group to, were lost to follow up and 4% had passed away at, by February. So we reviewed the interventions and we continued with the enhanced adherence support, continued with docket review sessions. Um, the return to care activities were maintained to bring these persons back to care. Another intervention we tried at one of our sites to 
better understand the low suppression was using the data that they had available to help the sites develop these run charts. And this was another QI activity led by our QI team, where they're able to look at run charts of viral load over time. And when they did that, you saw different pattern where persons who, without looking at the full picture, you know, interventions were being implemented based on their most recent viral load or their last two viral loads. But stepping back, you saw different patterns and realized that there were other issues at play and they were able to sit with patients, present this run chart and really assess them to understand what were some of the issues that were likely associated with the periods when they were suppressed but would become unsuppressed. Clearly, you know, based on some of the viral, viral load levels, likely stopped taking meds and then reinitiated and then stopped. And, you know, really working through those and being able to use this as part of the tools to educate patients around um, drug resistance. Um, in Jamaica, we have a limited regimen. We have first line, which is mostly TLD at this point. We have a second line regimen. And then after that, it's really, you know, salvage regimens. And this is because all of our drugs are provided through the government. Um, it's, a, I don't think, you were a middle-income country and there are limits to monitoring, li limits to procurement. And so we really have to work hard at preserving treatment lines. So, you know, being able to provide this kind of information and provide adequate education to patients around the benefits of becoming suppressed on first line and maintaining that regimen for as long as possible is very important. So those are some of the interventions we did around suppression. In the end, we actually, are really pleased with what we're seeing with the suppression results. So all of the sites over the last year have improved. Um, these two, these are the two largest sites and they have stayed above 90% for the last five quarters. Other sites have, KPH, this is one of our urban sites as well. Um, this is a, uh, really usually patients seen at this site are very ill, very advanced, um, and they're maintaining a really good level and improving suppression. And then these other three sites took some time, but they've also made significant improvements. And of note, CHAIRS, um, this is at University of the West Indies, a site that we provide financial support and technical support to, they became the first site in Jamaica to actually achieve the third 90, which is 90% of all of their patients are suppressed. And they're also on their way to achieving retention of over 90% of their patients. So they're doing really well. And this suppression at these sites have also changed the picture of the cascade in Jamaica because, you know, and I've mentioned them being the largest sites because once the suppression increased, we're talking a couple hundred patients becoming suppressed in the last year or two. And so oh, these are some pictures of our team working with site staff and with the national team to review the databases. Um, the cascade now in Jamaica's change we maintain the same 86% um, knowing their status, only a slight increase in the percent retained on ART. And you know this is a major focus for us moving forward, but the suppression has increased in a major you know, way where we are seeing 78% of patients who are on treatment um, being suppressed. And so that, is from, I think it was 56% in 2019. And so this is really one of the major achievements for the program, not just for the UCSF supported sites, but for the national program in Jamaica. So that's my last slide and I'm at 30 minutes. But in just conclusion, we've really been able to work with the team, the sites, the national program to show that collecting and using High quality data really does help to improve program management, improve implementation of services, and improve patient outcomes. Sites are overburdened. We don't have enough staff in any site. You know, we really could have more healthcare workers. And having COVID as an additional burden over the last two years has really um, made things 
even more challenging, but the staff, they're willing to use these systems once they're reliable, they're accessible, and they're seeing the impact it has on patient outcomes. With the challenges from COVID, we've had to be very flexible. You know, so knowing the HIV Center, this is where we really learned how to develop interventions in a very rigorous and methodical way. On the ground, with many moving parts, flexibility, engagement, collaboration are going to be critical to getting things done and to be able to implement and measure well. Um, we continue to struggle with retention and maybe in two years I can come back and show you a slide that shows 90% retention um, in Jamaica. We're looking at it, we're looking at the data, we're looking at other ways to implement services so that patients aren't coming to a site and spending a day. And so we're hoping these things will all um, improve the final outcomes. And that's my team. And thanks. Thanks so much, Charlene, uh, for that wonderful presentation. Um, a reminder to everyone, if you have a question, you can either enter it in the chat and I'll read it out for you, or you can use the raise hand feature and I will unmute you so you can ask your question yourself. We have a comment um, from your former mentor. She says, such great work, Charlie. Thank you, Susie. <laughs> Any questions? Thanks, Jenny. Stephen, <clears throat> can I ask a question? Sure, go ahead. Charlene, amazing work, really, uh, and so critical and so, in a way, down to earth, but this is really what it is about. And I was, I was wondering, um, in your list of reasons why people uh, mm. fell out of care, um, so there were a lot of practical circumstances. Was there, was there also a question about the treatment that they received in the clinic? So, for, and, and let me yeah. go straight to where I want to talk about, mm -hmm. and, that is, and that is stigma. Yes. I, yeah. I noticed that there is a large population of MSM and transgender mm -hmm. women. And I can mm -hmm. imagine that coming to a clinic for them is harder mm -hmm. than when you're straight. But, yeah, yeah. So they, attending clinic risk disclosure mm -hmm. was one of the um i think it was maybe one of the most frequently cited reasons um the disclosure was around hiv status and there was also some responses around sexual um, practices as well so that was a major reason and so the interventions to reduce Crowding was really important. So having evening clinics, mm. we also implemented a men's health clinic, which was designed to allow space for MSM persons to access care. But like I mentioned, COVID. <laughs> so all of the extra clinic sessions really ended because curfews, clinics had to end early, the staff were overstretched. They had to be doing more home deliveries. And so it was just harder to add an, any extra clinic sessions. Chairs, the site that achieved that 90, were able to, because they're more flexible, because they're at the university. So they mm -hmm. are able to implement services with more um, flexibility than the public health clinics. They were able to maintain a men's health, I think they did like a quarterly men's health clinic. And that allowed um, significant number of patients who came identified as MSM. And they also implemented more recently, I think in the last two or three quarters, an online support group for MSM as well. And so they have scaled up activities there and it shows in their retention, it shows in their suppression. And the other larger clinic comprehensive has also done some men's health activities. Um, I think they did their last one in February and they did one last quarter as well but it hasn't been consistent. But yes, stigma is an issue. And we also saw that play out in even some of the losses we experienced because persons would travel um, distance. So, you know, out of parish to come to a clinic to avoid seeing persons they know in the community or in the site. 
with the curfews and the restrictions with COVID, it was much harder, more difficult to go, you know, out of town or leave very early or come home late. And so persons either had to transfer to sites closer to home, or in a lot of cases, they just stopped coming to care. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, like everyone else said, Charlene, that was really great and really such important work, you know, and just like, you know, everyone said on the ground, important work. Um, so actually, your last comment, I, I sort of had two questions and you sort of hinted at it. And, and I'm sorry if you maybe said more of this in the presentation. I was called away for a very brief moment during your presentation. Um, I'm also thinking about issues around medical trust, mistrust, and how much that mm -hmm. does or doesn't come into play in the setting. And sort of related is COVID, you know, and, and similarly there, you know, trust, mm -hmm. mistrust, vaccine hesitancy. And actually, I'm going to throw in a third little twist, if you have anything to say, which you were just, I think, hinting at, is um, to what degree was COVID disruptive to people's care and actually, you know, viral suppression? And, you know, I don't know how much data is there. We're seeing in New York City and New York State, you know, as data is emerging that in 20 and into 21, that people, we're seeing viral load raises and lack of viral suppression because people oh, okay. can maintain their medications. And so any, anything about those things, if you can comment on. Yeah. So I think when we did the last follow-up survey where we interviewed around half of the patients who we brought back to care and asked them why, you know, why they stopped coming. Not believing their diagnosis or trying herbal or alternative um, treatment approach was a reason, but it wasn't a significant reason for persons who weren't in care. The, you know, the reasons were more structural or financial, um, not, or this belief that I feel fine, like, you know, I'm not sick, nothing wrong with me, <laughs> you know, was common as well, but not so much, you know, not believing the meds would help or not thinking they, or thinking they wanted something else, but it is present. Um, the, when, when COVID hit, one of the campaigns we started was a come to care campaign, and this was a media campaign, which was to say, you know, hey, this is a good time to come, get your immune system strengthened, mm -hmm. and, you know, check out your diabetes, because we have a severe non-communicable disease challenge in the Caribbean, probably the highest in the world. So most of, most of our population after a certain age have diabetes, have hypertension, right? And so for us, it was important to tie all of that together and say, come back to clinic, man, get all of those things checked out, um, get on treatment. Um, but we also have a severe vaccine hesitancy. Only about 25% of our population wow. is vaccinated against COVID. That's wow. been a real challenge. Um, I think it's higher among PLHIV, if they're in care, you know, that was definitely something that they would have received education around and they would have had the support of their treatment teams to help. I don't have the data on that, but nationally, it's a severe issue for us. Um, and then the final one around suppression. So this is part of the mystery, right? So in one of the slides, I mentioned that it was a curious for us when we started trying to understand why were so few persons suppressed they'd been in care for years on art and suppression was what was it 56 percent suppressed which is incredibly low right mm -hmm. um and so we really worked to try and get at the bottom of that throughout the covid pandemic period the last two years we haven't been very successful in stopping the loss to follow up. So we still lost quite a number of patients or have patients who are cycling in and out of care. But our suppression is at the highest level it's ever been in all of our sites. So if the patients stayed in care, we worked to strengthen clinical management. We've um, worked with motivational interviewing with all of the treatment staff. <laughs> you know, to really help engage patients in a different way. Um, the structural issues, the financial support, the transportation support, we've put those things in place and 
with that, we're seeing patients staying on the meds and it's working for them. Um, so yeah, so the, we finally hit the third 90 at a site, the country is really moving with the suppression. So it's, that's worked really well. So it's now to sustain that, keep these patients in care and then try to return the other patients who still aren't committed to treatment or still have barriers. So we're trying to figure out what those remaining barriers are, try to reduce them and strengthen um, their engagement because it works once they, they're able to stay. Great, thank you. Great insights, thank you. Thanks again, Charlene. Uh, we will be moving on with our program this morning, but thank you for um, a wonderful presentation of your research.